Come on, everybody, let's hear it for KT. <laughs> KT Praise and Music Band. Wow. That sounded a bit like the Phantom of the Opera. Do you know how that goes? How did that go? Oh, it was just like that. I think we better give a praise for Jesus very quickly. Be seated, everybody. Has everybody got a seat? It's easy to get a seat in the House of Commons than it is to get a seat in Kensington Temple. Who's that lady? Has the lady been raptured or has she just gone to the loo? If she's gone to the loo, too late. Somebody else has got that seat. Come on, everybody. You guys all right out there? No, you're shaking your head. Well, I'm, what can I do? I mean, you want to come and sit on the platform? Do you want to close those outside doors? Stop the draft. There it is. Just in case you're watching us in different parts of the world, we are so boiling hot this Christmas. 13 degrees. 13 degrees. My friends in Brazil saying we're 33 degrees. It isn't a competition. Anyway, it's wonderful. One of my Brazilian friends came to Britain in the winter and said, oh, what a very, very rich country England is. I said, why is that? They said, you have out of door air conditioning. <laughs> when I went to his country, I said, you have out of door sauna. <laughs> well, it is great to see everybody here tonight. And um, there's a little echoing on this microphone because we are behind the scenes trying very, very hard to link to the coronet. So this is our first try for the coronet. Come in, coronet. Your scores, please. Well, there you are. Just give me camera one up here and I'll talk to the... Okay, okay, okay. Come on, Christian. Hallelujah, let's give Jesus praise in the place today. Hallelujah. You may take your seats. Hi, Christian. Let's go live to KT. I think that Colin is there right now. Yeah, yeah you, you, you're sure I'm here. Keep still, man. Keep still. Keep still, man. Keep still. <laughs> I can't see the, the camera here. I can't see the yeah, camera. Yeah, just look, look, look yeah, this way. There you are. Look, don't move now. You're looking straight at me. Hi. Christian. Can you hear, all, can you hear them here? Can you hear, all, can you hear them here? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, Christian. So you've okay, been having so you've been having the same meeting as we're having. Yes, exactly the same meeting. We've had Noel Robinson. We've had Rachel Kerr. All the different artists that have been here. All the different artists that have been here. You sound like you're preaching in the valleys, alleys, alleys, alleys. And in the mountains, mountains, mountains. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Christian, the Bible says you should talk to your mountains. Amen. I've been speaking well, to these mountains, hallelujah. I've been speaking to these mountains, hallelujah. I've been speaking to these mountains, That hallelujah. only comes out by prayer and fasting. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'll be trying okay. that in the new year. So, to, I don't know if we can get a shot of the, of the audience there in the coronet. Can we do that? Can they swing the camera around? So God bless all of you at the coronet. Oh, that's it. They're gone. They'll be back in a minute. So Christian's on in good form. So uh, we've been having the simultaneous service, as you know, and we're linking now live for the message. And also there are people everywhere. The people behind me in the overflow area, the people downstairs, downstairs. Now, everybody, very quiet up here. And let's get you people downstairs to raise the floor level here by shouting a massive hallelujah. Let all Notting Hill Gate, and when we hear you, we'll let you know. All right, one, two, three. Not you. Not you. No, the people downstairs. We're going to hear them, all right? All right? Are you ready? Shh. Okay, let's try again. Downstairs only. Two, three. 
Did you hear anything? Is there anybody there? Oh, yeah, we hear them now. I mean, they're all well. Welcome to all of you downstairs in the lower hall overflow area. Now you can cut out all of the um, linking everywhere. I just want to say a few words to those who are watching on the internet and uh, some of you are watching live. And um, if you're out of our time zone, then either you are ahead of us or behind us. But anyway, God's time is now for all of us. And God bless you. I've had greetings from people in different parts of the world, and we're 30,000 people on the Facebook link, and I sent out a Facebook message today in as many languages as we possibly could. I learned some strange words today and got some strange replies from strange languages, but we're so grateful that you follow us on, on Facebook and that you link with us in these live broadcasts and you share with us. And, and our heart is so full of the love of Jesus for you all over the world. And some of you are in difficult places serving God in very difficult times. And we know that you appreciate the fellowship that we enjoy together. And I pray that God will continue to bless you, take care of you. Some of the new friends we've made this year as we've visited in some very difficult nations. And I know that you link up with us and not give too many details, but just let you know that God is with you, and God is going to take care of you, Amen. and God is going to use you. There's nothing that you need to fear, because God is in control. So let's welcome absolutely everybody that's linking with us right now all over the world. That's wonderful. So, we've had our full musical program tonight, and we're going to spend the rest of the evening, just coming up to 12 o'clock, in the Word of God. And we're going to focus on what the Holy Spirit is saying to our hearts, or at least one of the things He's saying to our hearts. So, let's just pray as we get ready to receive this New Year's message. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are with us, whether we feel it or not, whether our circumstances seem to reflect it or not, whether we understand what we're going through or not, because you are faithful in all circumstances. And we're so glad to know you. We're so glad that you have laid your merciful hand upon us. And we pray that as we move forward together into this new year, that we will move joined hand to hand, shoulder to shoulder, in the stand of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. The time is now. It was little Herbie's first appearance in the Christmas Nativity play. He was given the role of one of the shepherds looking after the sheep by night. He was so excited to be in the play and to be given even a speaking part. His cue was simple. As soon as he heard the leading shepherd stand up and say, Come, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened. He was to jump to his feet and say with a loud voice, come on, let's go and see the baby. He practiced and practiced his single line until he was absolutely sure that he'd mastered it. It had been a very, very difficult few weeks for him and the whole family. All the preparations of Christmas, the final day of school before the holidays, and all the rehearsals for the village nativity play. And on top of that, his mother had just given birth to the second child, Herbie's little baby brother, Jonathan. During the time, the later stages of the pregnancy, as the birth was drawing closer and closer, Herbie got more and more excited. Every day he would say, Mommy, 
when is the baby coming? When is the baby coming? He would say it again and again, and his mother would always be patient with the same answer, when the time comes, we will know. But on the day his mother went into labor, dad was working way down deep in the garden, and, and mum was in the kitchen with Herbie, and, and uh, said to, said to uh, Herbie, go, go, call dad, because the time has come. Get your father, the baby's coming. Everything went well, and Herbie was delighted to have a little baby brother in the house. Christmas Eve arrived, and the village hall was packed. The nativity play was running smoothly. Mary and Joseph had just arrived safely in Bethlehem. The innkeeper was delivering his lines impeccably. There's no room in the inn, but you can sleep in my stable. The angels were appearing to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest and earth peace to all people. Then the lead shepherd delivered his line with gusto. Come, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that what has happened. And he paused, waiting for Herbie. Nothing happened, so he said it again. Still nothing happened. By now all the eyes were on Herbie, whose poor little mind had gone completely blank. <laughs> Finally, there came a loud stage whisper from the audience. It was Herbie's dad. In a voice clear enough for everyone to hear, Herbie, all the shepherds on the stage, and all the mums and dads in the audience, he said, Go on, Herbie, now, Herbie, now, Herbie, the time is now. Herbie was confused and just stared back at his dad in the audience. His dad tried again. Herbie, now, the time is now. Finally, Herbie got it, stood up, and in an excited voice said, Come on, everyone, my mum's having another baby. <laughs> Get to know what you're expecting. Because when the time is right, it will happen. But I want to share something with you tonight about how God deals his time in our lives. There is a very real sense that it is always God's time. Always God's time. It is always God's time for something, something new in your life, something good, something great. With God, the time is always now. We're waiting together tonight for a moment, one moment in the year, when we all stop and count down till we come to that moment when we pass into the next year in a single moment. We don't give the same attention to every single second in the year. We couldn't do that. I calculated it myself and had it verified. There are 31,536,000 seconds in every year. And every second marks the flow of time in which we live, we love, we make decisions, face problems, dream, plan, and generally go about our business but we can only pay special attention to moments that mark significant stages in time, like tonight, the passing of 2011 into 2012. Now, this moment, in a sense, is a bit artificial. I've already greeted people from different parts of the world who have already gone into 2012 ahead of us and others who are behind us. Uh, but our calendar year, even though it's roughly divided into, into the four seasons and so on, is only a kind of convention, a reference point, so that we can keep track of dates and times. I find it actually extremely useful as it leads us to remember that time is passing away. The most precious and irreplaceable gift we could ever possess. The moment that is now is gone forever, never to return. We can never get it back. 
Surely using it wisely is the most important thing we could ever do. Our time is limited. It is fixed. The Bible speaks, roughly speaking, 70, 80 years. Much longer than that for some people. But in Psalm 90, verse 12, it says, Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We have ever more sophisticated ways of measuring time, atomic clocks and so on, digital technology. We're getting cleverer and cleverer at measuring time, but not always so wise in how we use it and how we understand it. I don't go a long way with those digital clocks. You know, I, I like the analog clocks. I don't, you know, the clocks that sort of go round. Because you can't see a context, can't you? And I like the paper calendars, because you can see things in context. And if you just have the moment appearing and changing, a digital clock will give you the date and the time, the second, but it doesn't show you the flow of time. But even in this little analog dial that we're looking at, which is fixed to real time, so I better make sure that I don't go over time tonight, and we'll be counting in midnight together from the clock, all right? But in a, in a very special way. So time has a context. We are very much aware of the context, you know, on midnight, New Year's Eve, because the context is 2011 will have gone and we will have stepped in to 2012. But here we see these two divine principles of wisdom. God gives us time, moment by moment. But he does so in the context of the flow of time from past into the future. And this is a very valuable thing. Imagine if you had no concept of the past or the future, only the present. would be totally incapable of reflecting on the past or anticipating the future. We'd have no sense of history or destiny. There'd be no sense of purpose, no direction, no movement or progression. But the God who is the Alpha and the Omega... The beginning and the end is the God both of history, the past, and the God of destiny, the future. I like that description of him in Revelation chapter 1, the resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ manifesting himself. And, and the word says, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. It's, it's interesting how John records it. He is the God who is. He is now. But he also was and is to come. That to me seems to be such a revelation of how we should live our lives. God gives us the now in which to live, but also helps us with our context from the past flowing into the future. This tells me that the great eternal God, the God of the universe, holds the past, the present, and the future in his hands. The Bible says the eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are, present tense, the everlasting arms. The God who was from all time and, be and, be and before. The God who has existed from before the, even, the, the beginning is the God who has taken care of every circumstance right up to this point in time. And he holds us and supports us now with the everlasting love that is him. But he also takes us and draws us into his purpose, which is able to drive us forward into the destiny his plans for tomorrow to give us a future and a hope. He is the great I am, the ever-present one, to help in time of trouble to be whatever we need him to be today. Now, in this moment, what time is it? The time is now. 
That's what time it is. Next time somebody asks you the time, tell them, the time is now. I heard a prophecy many years ago, which has become a kind of a joke for the kind of prophets who stand up and say kind of meaningless things. Like one prophet stood up and said, the Lord has shown me that I will be alive when Jesus comes unless he takes me home first. How about the other prophecy of a prophet praying over a pregnant lady? Thus says the Lord, it shall be a boy, but if you don't believe, it shall be a girl. <laughs> but there was this one prophecy, which I must confess to you right up until this very day, I thought was one of those stupid pizza prophecies. Here it is. If ever there was a day and hour in which we lived, it is today. Hmm. Is prophecy a gift of the obvious? Of course the day and hour in which we live is today. You need a prophet to tell you that, or do you? I now believe that that was a genuine word from the Lord. A word that says we are to live in the presence fully and completely. There's divine wisdom here. You see, you cannot relive the past. It's gone. And you cannot yet live the future. It's not here. It sounds like just stating the obvious, but... Bear with me because it's not so obvious in the way that we live our lives. It's not as obvious as it sounds that God calls us to live now in the fullness of his presence now. You see, so many of us carry so much baggage from the past that we cannot live in the present. Others are so burdened about the future, fretting and worrying about the future that we can't enjoy the present. It's like we're carrying the baggage of the past and the burdens of the future. So regretful of what has taken place, so fretful of what is yet to take place that we miss God today. But the time is now. Jesus set the record straight when he said, don't take any anxious thought about tomorrow, he said this, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In the old authorized version, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And what Jesus is saying, it's sufficient. You can live successfully in the moment. God has made you that way. He has not made your shoulders broad enough to carry yesterday's burdens or try to solve tomorrow's problems. Just live the moment because whatever is in your life now, it's in your life with God and His ability that He's given you to stand before him in the present. Over the last quite a few number of months, I've been pulling together uh, probably about two decades of research and study to build th three counseling training programs for our own people here in Kensington Temple. We've done the beginner's one, the first one, first, second level is coming in January the 25th, and then later on into the spring, summer, the third level. And I've been reading and researching and praying and studying and thinking about how to present these courses, one thing has struck me again. Most of the problems that we carry in life come from living wrongly in the past or being wrongly concerned about the future. This kind of living crowds out and suffocates the present so God says, 
The time is now. Live in the present. Clear the clutter of the past. Plan for tomorrow and anticipate it, but don't worry about it. What a ministry as we look out onto the uncertain world of 2012. Knowing that we can't hold the future, but God holds the future. The eternal I am, the God who was and is and is to come. You could say he's already been there. He knows all about it. But as we learn to, to push out the things that crowd out our enjoyment of the presence of God and the blessing of God and the challenges of God for today, for now, when we do that, we make room for God's purposes to flourish. God's purposes always flourish in the now. Hallelujah. You only have the strength to carry the responsibilities and challenges of one day, one day at a time. Thank God that there are ways of being set free from the negativities of the past and, and our unnecessary anxious concerns for the future. But let's learn how we can make space for the now moment of your life. The past, you can't ignore it, but you can forget it. This was Paul's great ambition, forgetting the things that are behind. I move forward to lay hold of the things that are to come. The future, you can't ignore it, of course not, but you can prepare for it today. The past, you can deal with it. The future, you can trust God for it. We deal with the past failures by receiving God's forgiveness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All the sins of 2011. Hallelujah. Washed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Stop living in self-condemnation. The Bible says there's no condemnation. As I'm to say, you just, you know, take a very... Careless attitude towards sin, not at all. But you know, we have an advocate with the Father. Yes, we do. We have a high court judge, higher than the highest court judge. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our advocate before the Father. He, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is present tense. The propitiation for our sins. Hallelujah. God's forgiveness granted freely and fully in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, come on, there's still some people I discern in the Spirit who aren't listening to me. It's under the blood. Christ carried your sins at the cross. Why do you hold on to what God has let go of? Why do you remember what God has forgotten? Don't let the devil accuse you. You are free from the past the worst possible aspects of the past. Gone, finished, washed, cleansed, sanctified. Let it go. Let it go. God has forgiven you. I've got to say it again. It's God has forgiven you. If you confess Christ as Lord and come before him, God has forgiven you. Whatever it is, let it go. God's forgiveness. You also deal with the past by forgiving others. Nothing causes curse-like operations of negativity to cling to your life more closely than unforgiveness. Oh, come on. Let it go. Let it go. It's like chains that bind you. Let it go. Bless those who curse you. Forgive them. Forgive them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. Unforgiveness binds you to the negativity of the past. 
the word of God makes it so clear. Oh, you can step into 2012 free, light as a feather. You won't even need to catch the bus home. You'll just float. <laughs> Forgive others. You can deal with the past by dealing with regret. Oh, God has the greatest solution to, to regret. It's Romans 8, 28. You know it. All things... All things, all things work together for good. For the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. All things! And the thing that you think you've messed up on more than anything else, double deluxe, tabillo boss, purple stripes, neon lights, messed up. God says, do you know, I am bigger than that. You bring it to me, and I will turn it around in such a way that it will work out for your good and for my glory. And when I've finished with the mess you've made, you will look at it and think that it was intended to happen because of the great blessings that have come from it. Hallelujah. Regrets. Regrets. The great Edith Piaf song. Non, rien de rien. Non, je ne regrette rien. Well, I don't know how, what motivation she sang it, but we have got to come into the presence of God and say, God, I want my regrets washed away because I can trust that even when I've messed up, you've got a plan to make it all right again. You can't have gone so far wrong that God does not have a solution to put it together. He is the God of restoration. Restoration. What wonderful healing words as we deal with the past. When we look towards the future, what do we see? The future is as bright as the promises of God. And His promises are for good, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. A hope is something good that is going to happen to you. Turn to the neighbor next to you and say, something good is going to happen. <laughs> this is not motivational positive thinking. This is the revelation of Scripture. God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Anchor your future to the hope and expectation of God's promises. Hallelujah. And in that way, you can build a positive future by doing what you do to, but doing what he called you to do today. So the present is where we live. We cannot live in the past or the future. Secondly, the present is where we make room for God's purposes to flourish, getting rid of all the clutter, making space for the Holy Spirit to bring good things to your life. And thirdly, tonight... The present is where we lay hold of the now times of God. The now times of God. What time is it? Now. The time is now. Have a look. See on your watch. What time is it? Now. The time is now. What time is it? Now. The time is now. The time is now. You say, I've come a long way to be told that the time is now. Oh, yes, but what is simple to the human mind is profound. It seems so simple. But how profound is this? I want to share with you three now times of God. And when we come to the stroke of midnight... 
for that now moment, which is about 32 or 20, 25 minutes away, 26, 27 minutes away, whatever it is, I can't see from here. <laughs> but I know the time. The time is now. We are going to lay hold of the now moments of God. And there are three, there are many more, but there are three I want to share with you tonight. Are you ready? Yeah. Number one, the now time is the today of God's acceptance of your life. The now time of God's acceptance for your life. See, we don't live in the now, do we? Because the Bible says now is the acceptable time. Is that not right? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, for he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you and have helped you. And you say, well, that's all very well, but when is the acceptable time? And God says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's so wonderful because ever since Jesus came, the future became now. The blessings of God became now. The promises of God became now. The gift of God's grace became now. The day of salvation became now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. For some of you tonight, the now time of God's salvation means that there is something you have to step into that you have never stepped into before. You have never stepped into the blessing and the gift of God's salvation. Because you've never understood Everything that God has made available, you didn't understand perhaps the true meaning of Christmas. You didn't understand the message of the gospel that says 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this planet. And in the little nativity story that I was telling earlier, reflects the big story, the reality of God manifested in the flesh. God's eternity touching our time, our, our world of space and time, and bringing with it the blessings of heaven, caught up and in a person, grace and truth in the person of Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son on this very planet saying, now is the day of salvation. Amen. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Take it and grab it. God's kingdom is now. God's blessing is now. God's salvation is now. Jesus has paid the price to make it happen. And so for you, this now moment, this today time of God, it's exciting because you can say, now I am going to step into God's salvation. I'm going to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I'm going to enter into the kingdom of God. Whoever you are, wherever you are, under the sound of my voice, downstairs in the lower hall overflow, across the road in the coronet, out there on the internet, watching on the DVD or however you are under the sound of my voice now, I urge you in the name of Jesus, seize your now moment. Step into the kingdom of God. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want the salvation that you give to me. Take it. It's just snatched by faith. It's a snatch and grab. Snatch it and grab it. By faith. Isn't that what Jesus said? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't mean to say it's out of reach. He said it's within reach. Reach out and grab it. Lift your hands and grab handfuls of the kingdom and bring them down into your life because salvation is now. Amen. That's for many people. You're going to step into something the very first time. But you see, many of us have already stepped there. Hallelujah. How many people remember the moment they stepped out of unbelief into faith? Out of living unrighteous lives, unbelievers, into embracing the love of God in Christ. How many people remember that? 
Where are you? The rest of you are not saved. <laughs> Let me put it in simple language. How many people have already been saved here tonight? Okay. The rest of you, you save your energy because your hands are going to be needed in a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. But for us, it is still the day of salvation. Because God's salvation is not just crossing a line and entering new territory. God's salvation is an invitation to go deeper and deeper and deeper into his presence, into his love, into the revelation of who he is, into his wholeness for our lives. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, which means that you will find yourself Totally acceptable to God every moment you draw near to him. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Would you imagine that? Would you imagine that? A lot of people think, if I got near God, he'd run away. Or if he got near me, I'd run away. Because God and I don't get along. But God's saying, you, you don't know something. You don't know how much I love you. You don't know how acceptable you are to me because I've taken all your sin and laid them on Jesus. I invite you to come closer. That's what it means in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Holy and acceptable and acceptable to God. He invites you to come because you are acceptable to Him. He has made you acceptable. So why do you hide? Why do you run away? Step up into the fellowship that God has for you. The today of God's acceptance for your life. The second now moment, the second today of God is the today of God's rest. For your life. This rest is like being on a permanent spiritual vacation. Now, okay, now some of you may think that I mean being on a vacation away from spirituality. And we know about that. You know, we had, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go on vacation. We're not going to see another Christian. We're not going to open our Bibles. We're not going to pray any prayers. We're not going to preach any sermons. We're going to enjoy ourselves in the sun. Now, I've got something better for you. Take your Bible. Take your Holy Spirit, spirituality, and have fellowship with the sun. This is the rest of God. If only we knew it, I'll tell you what. People are catching airplanes right now all over the world to try and find some peace and quiet and some rest. But the real rest is the rest of God in here. Hebrews chapter 3 says, verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, today, now, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they will always go astray in their hearts. They've not known my ways. So I've sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. But today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You know, these are some of the most sobering words of the whole New Testament. And they speak into tragic circumstances. I made a great study of the book of Hebrews. And it's so important to dig deeper and deeper into the Word of God and so you can understand words like this. What this is all about was a group of believers. Some say Jewish believers who had converted to Christianity. Some say proselytes, Gentiles who had converted to Judaism and now were embracing Christ, but certainly people with Jewish background. And they had made the bold step of following Christ, and they started so well. They were beginning to flourish, and then difficulties started to happen. And they became discouraged. 
And they said to themselves, ever since we began to follow this Christ, things have got tough for us. And don't forget, this was in a context way out of the norm for us, not all of us, but for most of us. Most of us, when we come to Christ, it's kind of, well, okay, you've become one of those religious nutcases, that's okay, you know, don't, you're, you go on your trip, I'll go on my trip, man, that's what they said to me, I got saved amongst the hippies, oh yes, I did, I was a hippie, well, kind of, I was too hard working to go into all this kind of stuff, but <laughs> everything else, the long hair, the peace and truth, Pre not much truth, no truth really, but just peace and love, man. Wow, man. Wow, man. One guy said to me, mm, where's your church? I said, my church is Kensington Temple. I was a church member here, you see, all those years ago. Oh, he said, no, my church is in my head. <laughs> well, I could see the smoke of Shekinah glory or something. <laughs> I said, oh, I, I thought you were talking about where I attended worship, but if you want to know where my Jesus is, he's not in my head. He's living in my heart. And the guy said to me, wow, man, far out, far out, man. Wow, far out. Most of us, we just might get a bit of ridicule, but we don't get what they got. None of them had been martyred, but they'd lost their possessions. Can you imagine? If you get saved tonight, it's not going to happen to you, don't worry. They don't put you off. But even if it did happen, you'd still have to love God anyway. There's no other choice. Today, get saved. Tomorrow, the bailiffs take everything away. Not because you're in debt, but because they don't like you. One of the most meaningful and moving few days in 2011 was where I went away with a small team from this church to a nation bordering a nation where Christianity, they just kill people, you're not allowed to be Christians. And we managed to draw together about a dozen believers from that neighboring nation over the border where we quietly and secretly met and began to teach and disciple them. Every single one of those people had come to Christ without preaching, but with the personal visitation of Jesus. They knew nothing as far as the Bible was concerned. We packed as much as we could into them, and heard all the stories of the killings and the persecution and the hardship, and we were sending them out again knowing that we would never see some of them again. But I can tell you there was greater joy in their hearts and lives than most Sundays here in Kensington Temple. Because during the time of tests and trials, they didn't harden their hearts and so miss out on God's rest. Let me speak to you very lovingly and directly tonight. What has gone wrong that has so deeply hurt you in 2011 and before? Because you see, that hurt can be healed or it can turn to hardness of heart. I know so many people who've hardened their heart because they've been hurt. And God says, no, don't harden your heart. I've I, I got, got something for you. And he says, help one another. Because he says, listen, verse 12, beware, brethren, lest any of you be in, be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. See how much we need each other? 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. As the pain and rejection and testing and trial hardened your heart, or are you going to say, I know where my rest is. It is in the one who said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek, I am lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. This rest of grace, this rest of peace, knowing that Jesus has conquered it all and we can simply hear his voice and move closer to him. That's the today of God's rest for your life. So we've had the today of God's acceptance for your life. We've talked a little bit about the today of God's rest for your life? What other now time awaits us? This is the today of God's purpose for your life. I came across a very interesting textual variant in one of the scriptures today. John chapter 9 and verse 4. I'm sure you all know it. It says, I, Jesus speaking... I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For the night is coming when no one can work. So Jesus had a sense of urgency. He knew there was a now time that God was giving him. And he knew that he had been sent from the Father to do that work, to accomplish that work, to fulfill the purpose for his life. And there was an urgency. He said, I must work the work for which he has sent me. While it is day. But I also noticed that some of the scribes recorded this as we must work the works of him. Who sent Jesus. In other words, somewhere along the line, somebody understood that this was not just about Jesus and God's call upon his life. But it was also about Jesus drawing us into, including us into God's purposes also. How wonderful that is. To know that God has said, I don't just want to save you and get you to heaven looking beautiful. That I can do. But I want you to serve me. I want to bring you alongside me in my kingdom. That together we can do the works of God. Hallelujah. In fact, Jesus even said this. Greater works than these shall you do. Because I go to the Father. And I tell you, we make no apology about this in Kensington Temple. you got to know it right from the very beginning if you don't know it already. We are a church of workers. We are a church of servants of Jesus Christ. We don't just come sit on our sweet nothings and sing sweet nothings to Jesus and go home and do nothing for Jesus. We are people who care that the world is inches from hell, that our nation is being sold out to the devil, and that there is a need that God calls us to fulfill. Amen and amen. Now is the time to serve him. What great privilege. You know, as I was thinking about this, I realized it always was this way. It's never been any different. You think when you get to heaven, you're going to say, well, in heaven, I don't have to do anything. I tell you, this is training for reigning. (laughs) And from the very beginning, even in the perfect world, God created the heavens and the earth and the mountains and the oceans. And Christian was in the mountains and I was in the valley. But whatever was happening... 
in the very beginning, and, and, and there was a perfect world. You remember God said, he looked at everything he'd made and said, it is good, and then he rested, praise God. We stepped into, humanity stepped into a work that was already accomplished and ready perfected, hallelujah. That's the rest of grace. We've been speaking about that. But he didn't say, what are you doing, Adam? Well, you said it's rest. No, 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 no. There's a garden to look after. A garden? What's that? Let me show you. Oh, but it looks so beautiful. Everything is right. The trees, everything. It's so beautiful. All the luscious fruit. It's amazing, God. What do you want me to do? I can't add to your finished work. Oh, no, 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 no. But you can tend and care for it. And even in this perfection that I have made for you, I've given you a capacity that you may find purpose in fulfilling my plan for you here and now. How wonderful. How wonderful. So from the very beginning, we weren't just sitting around on a cloud or by streams, eating luscious fruit, all the good stuff, not that bad fruit, not the naughty one, and just enjoying life. No, there was a purpose. God said, I've given you a job to do. I want you to rule over these things. I've given you significance. I've given you dominion. I've given you authority. Rule on my behalf. Subdue this. Bring it into a whole different order. I've given you a capacity to be fruitful, a capacity to be productive. Hallelujah. And that has not changed. He says to us, just as we approach 2012, be fruitful and multiply. The today of God's purpose for our life is I, you, me, we must work the work of him. Work the works of him who sent us. Didn't he say, as the father sent me, so I send you. He sent us out into the world. Watu wa mungu. Wanataka fanya kazi. Kwa mungu. Thank you. I said, at least I think I said in Swahili, people of God, don't you want to work for God? Did I say that? Thank you. We used to sing this old song. There's a work for Jesus. Only you can do. It's not about me, me, me. It's not about what I can get, grab, take, snatch, believe God for, for me, myself. And my shadow. It's about what we can offer him. Living sacrifices. Jesus in 2012. Thank you. For taking away 2011. And all ugly stuff. Thank you for the good stuff. Thank you for your faithfulness. Mercies new every day. Thank you for the victories. Thank you for the successes. Thank you God for that stuff. Thank you. But I let go of the sins, failures, the regrets of the past. Thank you, Lord, that 2012, I don't know what it holds, but I know who holds it. It's in your hands. I don't take any anxious thought about tomorrow. I've got enough to deal with today. Today, I come into your presence, Lord, and today I receive your acceptance. Minister to me that I am beloved by God in the well-beloved. Thank you, Jesus. I come before you today, Lord, and I soften my heart that I might enter into the fullness of your rest. And don't allow any pain or bitterness or anger or hurt or resentment or trial to put me off. Because today... There is a rest of accomplishment, of joy, and fulfillment in Christ today, now. And I thank you, Lord, for the today of your purpose for my life. 
that I might love you, live for you, serve you, do the works of him who sent us into this world. The God of purpose always involves us. And that is how we impact our world and make a difference for him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We have two minutes. And at 10 seconds to midnight, we're going to count it down and we're going to shout and declare together, thank you, Lord, the time is now. And we're going to seize that moment. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, before we come to that moment, I'm going to ask you, all over this building, all over the various buildings where we're overflowing, if you want Christ in your life and you want to seize the moment of coming to know Jesus Christ, lift your hand up high, bold, right where you are, and I'll pray for you, and then we'll give you something straight after the midnight hour. Are you ready? Lift your hands. You're saying, I want Jesus in my life. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. All over this place. Could we have the consolidators, please? Upstairs, lift your hands high, up there in the balcony, all over this place, downstairs, lower hole overflow, over the road there in the coronet. Keep your hand lifted high till somebody comes to you and gives you this booklet, and we're going to pray for you. That's be the second last thing we'll do in 2011. Here we go. Father, for every single person who's responded to you tonight, God grant that salvation will be their portion, that by faith they will enter into the kingdom of God and know you and know that you totally accept them by the work of Jesus for them. And for us, Lord, as we rise to lay hold of 2012 in the now moment. We say, what is the time? And the people of God said, the time is now. Are you ready? Let's go. 10, 9. Jesus!